The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Stopped. Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, on a day when we're going to talk spring training baseball and no politics. Jerry Feigelberg is my guest, and let's see if we can get through a whole whole show without screwing it up and bringing us all down. Jerry, how are you? I am doing well, Ralph. Uh, it's such a beautiful day today, and uh, I'm going to let people in on the, on the best well-kept secret in the country. Alameda has the best weather in the United States, bar none. Literally 365 days a year, it averages out to be the not only the average, there are no extremes. It rarely gets hot and it rarely gets cold. And not only that, um, we're close to San Francisco. The weather is 10 degrees warmer in Alameda than in San Francisco. And... Um, all is pleasant on a spring day, and um, we've started spring training. You're an A's maven. So bring us up to date on the A's and um, give us your rundown of what you expect out of this year's baseball season. Jerry Feigelberg. Yeah, the, the A's are, uh, won the, the, uh, Western, the American League Western Conference Championship last year. Uh, and uh, they made that they defeated a very good Chicago White Sox team in, in the wild card round to advance to the AL uh, division championship. And unfortunately, they lost. They lost to the Houston Astros in the seven games. Man, and they were down in Dodger Stadium, and baseballs were flying out of the park. Both teams were hitting them, but the the Astros were slightly better. And of course, uh, no one. No one was pulling for the Astros last year. People were pulling for Dusty Baker, but not for the Astros because of the uh, signal stealing scandal. And mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the Rays eliminated him, and the Rays went to the World Series and, and lost to the Dodgers. I believe it was six games. So here we are. the the A's The A's are back again for the 2021 season. They're going to be playing 162 games. Uh, they had. They they lost some players to free agency. The significant players were their shortstop Marcus Semyon. Um, Marcus, they never even offered Marcus a qualifying offer, which would have been eighteen million dollars. They just let him go. They had the offer him, they would have gotten a draft choice. And the uh, the Blue Jays, I believe, signed him to a two year deal, probably for about eighteen million a year. You got to remember that Marcus. Why, why do you suppose? Why do you suppose they didn't um, tender um, Simeon? Uh, the A- the A's really don't get into into those big contracts. I do, they they are willing to go with other players that can get they feel that can do the same job with less money. That's been their modus operandi for many, many years, at least certainly since the uh, 96 season and after uh, Walter Haas passed away and went to Schott and Hoffman, then it went to uh, Lou Wolf, and uh, now John Fisher is running the whole show. And the, that, that's the way they operate. They look for undervalued uh, veterans, and they look for rookies that are coming up to want to play, and they'll, they'll get them for – for the minimum, five hundred seventy-five thousand a year, whatever it is, it's, it's still a good salary. But they feel the drop-off is not that great, and they're willing to do what's necessary. So they were willing to let Semyon walk. Semyon may have and, wanted and to sign Andrus, who is like seven years older. And well, um, actually, actually, Andrus, I think, is just a year older. Andrus is thirty-two. And oh, really? Simeon is thirty or thirty-one. Yeah. So he's I didn't realize Simeon was, uh, Simeon was that old. I thought um, 
took him a long time to develop. They got a solid um, all pro year out of him. And it's, it would frustrate me if I were a fanatical A's fan. Oh, it is very frustrating. Uh, Semyon came here uh, to, for the 2015 season. Uh, after the 2014 season, when the A's melted down in the uh, Kansas City game, in the wild card game, uh, you know, John Lester left as a free agent. They traded. They had traded earlier for Jeff Samarja from the Cubs, and then they, they traded Samarja back to the White Sox, and they got Chris Bassett and uh, Marcus Semyon in the trade. It took a while for Bassett to become successful. He had injuries, and there were some problems with him, but now he's a he's a, a very productive member of the starting rotation. And Semyon, in his first year, uh, committed 35, 40 errors at shortstop. He remember he was a second baseman with the White Sox. He came back, came over, and was playing a totally different position. And uh, Ron Washington became available that season, late in that season. And he started. He was not the, the third base coach. That was Mike Gallego. But they, the A's eventually fired Gallego, installed Washington at third base, and the and Washington would work with with Semi. I saw him working with him. I asked Ron, "What do you think?" He said, "The kid's got all the tools. Semi has all the tools. I just have to work with him." And he and you remember Semi uh, Washington worked with uh, Eric Chavez, the third baseman with the A's. Chavez won six gold gloves and he gave one of his gold gloves to uh, Ron Washington. So Washington was an expert in training fielders and he would work hours with him, working on his fielding, his positioning, his feet, his throwing on a throwing position and do everything necessary to, to become a good shortstop. And it paid off in 2019 when Marcus finished third in the MVP voting. So that was a big loss, but you know they brought in Elvis Andrus. And he's uh, he he will be a, an adequate replacement. the The other big loss was Liam Hendricks, who had two who had two good years as the closer for the A's. And Liam became a became a an all star with the A's and became a free agent. And the A's weren't about to pay his pay his money. They've had experiences with closers. And they know that uh, this year's closers can be next year's bust. So they weren't willing to pay him the big bucks. And uh, Hendricks uh, moved on to the Chicago White Sox. And the, the White Sox are loaded. They they are going to be a very, very good team in the American League Central. They should win the division. They got, uh, they got, they got some pitching. They got Tony La Russa back managing. They've got. Uh, is is that a plus, or um, in your opinion? No, seriously. There's, uh, there's a lot of controversy about Tony coming back at the age of 76, and you know he had, he was arrested. I don't know if it was over the winter in the off season for a DUI, and you know, maybe he's lost his zeal for managing, or is he managing by road? I'm not sure, but. Uh, uh, they wanted him in Chicago, and he took the job. He certainly knows the game as well as anybody, so he's a Hall of Fame manager, and uh, I would want him on my club if he's the Tony Larusa that was managing the A's back in the '80s, and the Cardinals, and uh, when they went to the World Series and won the World Series in 2006. So, uh, well, not just not just from a baseball knowledge standpoint. But from a human being standpoint, let's assume you had a kid, a son, and um, you, he was a hell of a prospect with the White Sox, needed some development. Would you be happy that Tony La Russa is in charge of, um, of your son's development? No, not from, not from a baseball. From a, um, the man has a substance abuse problem, and um, I would want him leading my organization if I ran a, um, a turd factory. To be honest with you, <laughs> just uh, well, I don't I don't know the extent of his is alcohol abuse problem. I, I don't know if it's serious or it was a one-time affair. 
But as uh, from a baseball perspective, I saw what a, uh, what uh, Tony did with the young players when they would come up with from the farm system with the A's. For example, the A's brought up Scott Brocious, and he was the third baseman. A's, uh, Tony put him out in center field. And if he didn't produce, he sat him down. He wouldn't let him get into a rhythm. So he would he would go to he didn't know he was playing third base. He was playing the outfield. If he didn't if he didn't produce that day, he'd be sitting on the bench. So his confidence was was not there. You know, players are not going to go two for four every day. They're going to go zero for four, zero for eight, zero for twelve. They're going to make errors. They're young players. It takes time it takes time for them to develop. Well, they traded Brocious to uh, New York for Kenny Rogers, and uh, Brocious blossomed in New York. And you have to remember in the 1998 World Series against the San Diego Padres, Brocious was the most valuable player. Yeah. And so That wasn't a one-sided deal. Kenny Rogers pitched some good innings for the A's. Right, but he didn't want to be here. He did not want to be here. It, his heart wasn't in it. So, you know, they, they let him go, and he went to the Mets. And uh, I forgot who the A's got in the trade, but uh, he was a pretty good pitcher. He threw a perfect game. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. Um, who replaced the closer for the, for the A's this year? Yeah, the A's just signed Trevor, Trevor, Trevor Rosenthal. Or Rosenthal broke in with the Cardinals when was he could throw the ball 100 miles an hour. But like so many young players, guess what? He had Tommy John surgery, and it took him a while to get back. He, when he came back, uh, the Cardinals cut him. He was with another club. His earned run average was around 13.5. He just couldn't couldn't regain the form. However, last year, he, where I forgot where he was pitching, uh, he, he, he regained his form. And uh, they, they is pay, are paying him $11 million. They, they feel that he's going to be their guy coming out of the bullpen to, to end the game. So okay. we'll see. It's a gamble. It's a gamble. I remember they, they signed Jim Johnson a few years ago to be their closer, and Johnson came out of the bullpen and blew almost every save he was, he was in, and they were paying him $10, 11000000 million a year. And they, they had to let him go and eat and eat the loss. So that happens in baseball. You just never you just never know what's going to happen. Especially with with, with all teams, the bullpen is the hardest position to predict from year to year. You hit on it a little bit. Um, it's a gamble. And uh, I don't blame them for not throwing big money into a bullpen. Um, and let's give, while we're at it, as far as uh, decision makers over the last 15 years, Billy Bean has been a tremendous decision maker. He has uh, kept the team going with uh, candle wax and, um, uh, you know, string. Um, so I give him a lot of credit. He was always looking for the day when he'd have enough money to work with to really be a contender, not that he was, to be a championship, to take, they've been contenders, to take him, take them over the edge. Does it look like that's going to be the case with this ownership? I don't think so. I, I, I just don't think so. Uh, they, they've used this formula so well. Back when, when the Haas family owned it and they needed a player, uh, they won three pennants in a row, 88, 89, 90. They went out and got it, signed a Dave Parker to be their, their DH. They made a trade for Ricky Henderson. And back in those days, they, they gave Ricky the, the most money that NEA had, and that was, I think, in 89 or – I think it was 89. They got a $3 million a year salary, which is, which is peanuts today, but back then it was good money. So the, those – when when the ownership was willing to do it and and uh, spend the money, they put fans in the ballpark. I remember in the either eighty eight or eighty nine or ninety one of those years, 
uh, they they put almost almost three million people came into the Coliseum. They're lucky. Hey, both, they get to, both Bay Area teams in '89 drew like hell, and they both won. And they they both went to the World Series. Um, yeah. Kind of an earthquake year, if you will. Um, that kind of, if you remember that uh, start to the '89 World Series, it was oh yeah, uh, Game, unbelievable. I think it was Game Three, October seventeenth, nineteen eighty nine. I think it was, and I think it was the first Subway Series since the fifties uh, when the Dodgers met the Yankees in the uh, World Series. I think the last Ooh. time that that happened was nineteen fifty six. Yes, the year Mickey had his nineteen fifty six was Mickey Mantle's best year. In, in the majors, and it just goes to show what a superstar he was and how if injuries didn't interfere, or, and plus combine that with his lack of, of rehab ability or desire to rehab, um, he could have been Cobb with power, as Casey Stengel referred to him when he first came up. Uh, he was magnificent, Mickey Mantle. Um, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame that the youngsters of today didn't get a chance to see him play to see how good he was. He was he had it all. He had, he was a five tool player and excelled in in everything, all of them. Hey, I feel sorry for those who didn't grow up in the fifties, watching in the early fifties, um, watching Duke Snyder, Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle playing in the same town, the same city, the three greatest, greatest center fielders of their time. Um, maybe any time, if you think about it. Um, wow. Three Hall of Famers. Three Hall of Famers played within miles of each other. And, um, when the I've said this before, when the Dodgers and Giants left, it broke the heart of the city. It really crumbled a whole bunch of of kids' faith in you know in sports and the way it should be. And um, I've always said, when a team moves from a city, they're only punishing the kids. They're the ones that um, that lose the most. And um, hey, listen, I was 11 when the, those same Giants, Yankees, and Do- or Dodgers moved. And um, even though I was blessed to still be in New York, and we got to see some great Yankee teams, it just wasn't the same without the pure rivalries. Do you fear yeah. that could happen? To the A's, the kids who are growing up following the A's, or the kids like myself who are kids in name only, but um, were still still kids at heart. Do um, you think that'll happen again eventually, or do you think they're going to be able to finally get a ballpark in place? Um, what's your prediction on that? Well, you, you can never say never. Right now, the, the A's are, are making efforts to stay in town. They they are they're a couple of years behind now with the ballpark. They wanted the ballpark ready by 2023, and because of COVID and and environmental impact reports, it's taking a little bit longer. So it might take to 2025. But I, as we said before, and we've discussed this many times, I will believe that when the steam shovels hit the ground and start putting the piles in to build the stadium, that then then I'll, it'll be a reality. But right now, there's no place for the A's to go. Where are they going to go? Most of the cities that can, can sustain a baseball team have a team. So I think the A's are stuck here. And well, and, actually, and actually, I can name two cities that would be great candidates just off the top of my head, and that's Montreal and Charlotte. Well, so, uh, I'm, sa- I'm saving Montreal for the Tampa Bay Rays when, they're, when their deal with the uh, stadium is up in 2027. It would be wonderful to have Montreal, Toronto, Boston, New York, and Baltimore in the Eastern Division. 
It makes more sense. This is great rivalries between Toronto and, and Montreal uh, all the time, just like New York, New York and Boston, San Francisco and L.A. So that's a natural. There's the hockey rivalries between the Maple Leafs and the and the Montreal Canadiens are are legendary, and the same thing with the uh, the rivalries between the Boston Bruins and the Montreal Canadiens. So there's rivalries, natural rivalries between the cities, and that should help baseball putting put fans into the seats. So that would be good. Charlotte, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, you know, anything's possible. Charlotte, Charlotte is a possibility. But I think the A's are going to work out their problems. They're going to stay here. Okay. That's uh, a positive way of looking at things. And positive, positivity really doesn't hurt. That's, uh, you got to keep got to keep that uh, hope going. The only time positivity hurts is if you're holding an, elect, an electrical cord and it's not wrapped. Then you get a positive <laughs> charge. <laughs> That's right. That would be shocking. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> tell me about Chapman, the A's third baseman, and did they really come close to dealing him? And is that possibility still out there? Uh, no, he's. I think he's got two more years of arbitration left, so they're not. They're not going to deal him for a while. Um, and uh, uh, Matt had a tough season last year with that hip injury, but apparently he's uh, he's overcome the injury and he's looking good in spring training. Uh, the the A's the A's infield. Uh, they got two mats, Matt Chapman, Matt Olson, Elvis Andrews at shortstop. Second base is their problem. You saw that they signed Jed Lowry to a minor league contract. They're hoping that if Jed has anything left in the tank, uh, they they can put him at second base. You know, he, his range had diminished by 2018. And then when he left as a free agent, he went to the Mets. And he played played three games for the Mets in two years. His knees oh. were shot. So Tell me about they're, hope, they're hoping he has some gas left in the tank. He certainly could DH, and they need a left-handed bat because they're primarily a right-handed uh, lineup. Um, Olsen is really their only lefty in the lineup. And then they signed uh, Mitch Moreland, uh, and Moreland's a lefty, and he can, he can, he's got some power, and he can DH too. And he can also play first base to give Olsen a day off right now and then. Oh, Olsen. Another guy you lost was that power hitting DH, um, whose name I can't think of, who yeah, hit two forty one three years in a row. Yeah, he he he, he hit over one hundred sixty home runs. Chris Davis. But Chris Davis. A, they had him for four years. He had a six year deal. He he got hurt. In, Pittsburgh in 2019, and he wasn't the same after that. For the, for the, in the 2019 season, and and during the regular season last year, out of the 60 games, he didn't play more. He played in about 30, 35 games. And he only had two home runs. He came to life a little bit in the playoffs, but they're looking at themselves and, and in the front office that we're not going to pay him 16 million dollars a year to play half the games and hit maybe 15 home runs. We can get a lot of other talent for that kind of money. So they made a decision, and they shipped him off to, to Texas. We, and he loved hitting in Texas. He killed the Rangers over the years. He hit his, most of his home runs. Uh, the, the Rangers gave him up. We're the number one team that gave him the, gave him, uh, the home runs. How you like that? So he's hitting the – well, that was in the old ballpark. Probably we'll see what happens in the new ballpark. And Okay. You just you just wish him well. He 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 did his job. He he was a funny guy. He was very quiet. Didn't like to talk to the press. But everyone's different, and he was within himself. He was a good teammate. So, as I said, you wish him well, and uh, hope he has. He hope he finds his uh, stroke again down in Texas, but not yeah, against the A. For his sake, he was. Uh... How many home runs did he average? Forty home runs a year for those three years. Four years. Four, four years. Over four. Yeah, he did it for four years. 
the fifth year is when he got hurt, and last year was the sixth year. So they they didn't give up much to get him, and he produced. He hit what two forty two forty one for four years in a row. How consistent was that? Yeah. Hey, listen, spring is for dreaming. Anybody who has a shot at making it, who would be a real help. And I'm thinking just everything you said, they lost some power in Chris Davis. What's going to replace that? Is there anybody coming up that we could? Actually, actually what what they could do is Mark, Mark Canna has some good power. If he plays regularly, he's 25 homers. They can use Mitch Moreland, who's good for if he plays every day, 15, 20 homers. So they're going to get some production out of these guys. Uh, Chad Pinder can hit home runs. So they're going to be okay. They're going to be Were they fine. looking at Chad, at Chad Pinder for second base for a long time? Yeah. The, uh, they, they, he's very versatile. He can play, play just about every. He can play shortstop, third base. He can play left field, center field, right field. So he's a very valuable player. And but he 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 doesn't he doesn't get enough playing time. He's not a regular. He's a super sub. So but they will consider him for second base. They got Tony Kemp who hits from the left side. He who, he might be a contender for second base and also to hit lead off. They could they, they got this the mail uh machine. Uh I hope I pronounced his name right, Machine. And and so he's a candidate for the second base job. Jed Lowry's a candidate. So there will be plenty of opportunities. They lost Robbie Grossman to the Tigers. Grossman was a switch hitter, and he, he hit mostly from the left side. And so that's why they, they, they got, went out and got a lefty bat. Uh, Lowry's a switch hitter, and Moreland's a lefty bat. So then you had some more balance in their lineup. So we'll see what happens uh, as the season progresses in that. The A's, well, the A's, every, every time you mention Lowry, I'm a Met fan, and I liked Lowry as a shortstop w- with the A's. And I was happy when the Mets got him. But, oh, my God, <laughs> three games in two years, uh, yeah. that, that was horrible. So my question is, why do you expect anything out of him? Has he rehabbed in a way – that um, has he shown shown anything in rehab? We don't know. I don't. I don't know. What, what, you know obviously, Ace felt strong enough to sign him to a minor league deal. Uh, it's it, you know, it's probably not guaranteed. If he doesn't make the team, you know they're going to cut him. So they're just hoping that he, as I said, he has something left left in his body. You know, he's what thirty six years old. So. In 2019, he, he hit the most home runs in his career. He had a oh, he's a doubles machine, and you want a guy like that that, that can hit, has a good stroke and can hit the ball. And but if his legs are gone, you, you know you can't. You got to use your legs when you hit. You get to drive right. into. So they're they're hoping they're hoping that he's been rehab rehabilitated. Whether or not it's true, we don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But they um, have other pieces. They have other pieces. They got Pinder. They got Machine. They got Tick Kemp. They're going to be okay. And, you know, and we didn't even talk about their pitching. Their starting pitching, and their bullpen. You know, they they got three three or four guys. They may have six guys for the rotation, starting rotation. You know, they've got uh, Sean Manaya. They've got uh, Frankie Montas, Jesus Luzardo. Chris Bassett, Mike Byers, AJ Puck, the lefty, and if, if you know they can they can mix and match. If Puck can't make it as a starter, they'll put him in the bullpen as a long reliever, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. You know they they picked up Rosenthal, they picked up Sergio Romo, uh, Usmero Petit will be back, Trevino will be back, JB Wendelkin will be back. So they got they got players in the bullpen, both starters and relievers. And I don't. Hopefully, the drop off between Hendricks and Rosenthal is not that great. Uh, they lost Joaquin Soria, but they picked up Sergio Romo, and Romo played yeah, that's pretty a, well. That's a big, he's had winning experience. He was in the, the three day, three 
championship years with the Giants, and yep. it doesn't hurt to have a guy sitting out in the bullpen talking to young players about his experience. And um, I think that that'll be a good one. How about catching in the outfield before we get to be, get into okay. the bullpen? Oh, catching. Okay, right now, uh, Sean uh, Murphy is out. I think he he had punctured his lung or had a collapsed lung, and he's recovering from that. I don't think he's going to be ready for the season. I think they're going to have Austin Allen, and they picked up a, a guy who's about a 160 hitter, so they, they have to wait for, for Murphy to get back. Now the outfield is pretty well set with uh, Stephen Piscotti in right field, Ramon Laureano, Laureano in center field. Left field is is up for grabs, and there'll be competition between Pinder, Canna, Kemp for that position. So it depends who's pitching. So maybe Kemp will be will be will be playing. They might have uh, if if Lowry makes the squad, Lowry might be uh, DHing if a, if a righty is pitching, and Kemp will be playing in left field. Who knows? That's that's up to uh, Bob Melvin to make those decisions. But they have a lot of versatile players who can play different positions, and that's what they like, and they're good when they're out there. So th- that's that's the outfield. Okay. Um, tell me about the fan experience, not just for the A's, but for all teams in baseball. What could a typical fan in a typical city expect when he goes, he or she, and she sometimes, goes to the ballpark? Will they be able to sit with others? Will they, Tell me what, what baseball's plan to protect and um, get back past the cardboard, uh, cardboard cutouts watching your team? Well, right now, uh, Alameda County is still in the purple, and that means no nobody in the stands. <clears throat> I, if they move up to the red zone, they probably will be allowing maybe 25 percent of the people to come in, <clears throat> and they'll have the they'll have the social distancing and the fans. Now the Coliseum holds what? Well, uh, with the tarps. With the tops blocking off Mount Davis, the 35,000 35, people, let's say. So 25% is about eight or 9,000 people, which is typically a Monday night crowd. It's not very very crowded on Monday night. So the A's could live with, it, live with that. It brings people in. They'll sell some hot dogs. They'll get money for parking. Uh, it will help. It will help. Uh, as more and more people get vaccinated, and remember, uh, President, this is our only political speech at the moment uh, of the you know, I had, program. I had one more I was thinking about, but that, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, but, but you, yours first. Yeah, but President Biden announced yesterday that they're going to have enough vaccine to vaccinate every adult by the end of May, which was two months earlier than they had thought. Uh, vaccinations are going up to over 2 million a day now, and they, they have a, a, a goal of 3 million a day. That's because the he used the uh, Defense Production Act, and um, they have, they used that to get two more manufacturing facilities for Moderna uh, and Pfizer. Pfizer, of course, is the same thing. They're making they're making more Pfizer vaccine, and then. Now Johnson and Johnson just came out with their one-shot vaccine, and Merck has gone into co- cooperation with uh, Johnson and Johnson, and they are manufacturing doses. And we're going to get everybody, everybody that wants to, to be vaccinated. We're going to get it done by the end of May. That well, that's mean, the that scientific doesn't... part, but yeah. you bring in states like Texas, who are going to open up their their state, no masks mandated, bars open, restaurants open. What happens when visiting teams come into Texas? Well, first of all, MLB MLB has certain certain requirements. 
and I, I think it would be wise for MLB to, to make sure that you cannot enter the ballpark unless you're wearing a mask. Now, with everybody getting vaccinated, they may demand to see your vaccination certificate to make sure that you have been vaccinated. And if you don't have it, you can't come to the ballpark. Even in Texas, which opened up uh, stores like Target and the big chains are saying, you can't come in unless you have a mask on. You, we're not letting you in. We don't care what the governor says. We want to protect our staff, and we want to protect our shoppers. And if you can't deal with it, go somewhere else. So uh, individual companies and stores can still require masks. If they they, they don't have to be, you know, uh, follow Abbott's uh, decree. So those are things that could happen. And, yes, you're right. One of the you've seen last year, how many games were canceled? Did did the Cardinals lose a lot of games? Did the Phillies lose a lot of games? Weren't the A's playing playing seven inning double headers? God forbid. Who launched seven inning double headers games? Right. People pay fifty four dollars for the worst seat in the house and don't want to stay around for those extra two uh, two yeah. innings. Yeah. That, that, just amazing, amazing. By the way, our, our friend down in Tampa, Peter Golenbach, mm-hmm. he went to see, he went to see the Rays play the Baltimore Orioles. He had he, and he wanted to see the Detroit Tigers in Lakeland. You go over to those two facilities. The Orioles wanted for a preseason game. You know how much they wanted for a ticket? No. Fifth, Fifty-four dollars for preseason games, and it was worse in Lakeland. The Tigers wanted eighty-four dollars for a ticket for a preseason game. Peter said, "No, thank you." Went home. Yeah. Well, uh, knowing Peter as we both do, for an incredible baseball fanatic who was waiting for baseball all winter long to just go home. It really shows you how bad things are getting. Um, And we haven't, speaking of bad, we haven't even gotten into the obliteration of the minor leagues and player development and uh, this, that, and the other thing. And um, bottom line, five five years from now, with all these cutbacks and minor leagues and what have you, the quality of ga- of the game will have decreased appreciably, um, and well, they right, don't. Care. Right now, right now they got to do something about the shift. The shift is killing the game. The Buster Posey was was quoted the other day as saying, "He says Brandon, you know Brandon Crawford." There's a hit up the middle. He he runs over and he makes a diving stop and then gets up and makes the throw to first base. It's beautiful to see. Now it's a routine ground ball. He's, he's standing right there with the ball and, and with the shift. Guys can't left-handed hitters can't get hits to right field. The the ball gets through and there's there's the second baseman playing short right field to throw him out at first. Who wants to see that? I want to see players get hits. I don't want to see and you want to see, and you want to see the athletic plays and the guys in the position to make the athletic plays. What kind a guy's playing short right field? What kind of athletic play is that going to be? Not, be not the balls hit, yeah, the balls hit right to them. You don't see them diving for the balls like they used to, and it's it's really sad. You know, you, you want to go to a game, you walk, strike out, home run. Okay, wake me up. Yeah. I'd be interested in seeing some stat, stats. Do, does the shift prevent more runs than it used to? Or are they, they scoring the same amount of runs, shift or no those shift? Are, those are good questions. I don't have the answers for that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Uh, well... Maybe you and I can find out that answer, and we'll talk about it the next time we meet. How about that? That sounds good. I just want to tell you that last Sunday, my daughter invited me up to Alameda, and we went out to Alameda Point, 
and we went to the Faction Brewery Company, and they they took their parking lot. They have a lot of parking out there on the old Alameda Naval Air Station, and right. they have those. They had tables more than six feet apart from everybody. The view, they were so close to downtown San Francisco. The view was spectacular. And um, um, they served and they served a pretty good meal, and we enjoyed it. It was my first great. meal out at a restaurant in a, in a year. Wow, wow. And to be able to spend it with your daughter makes it extra special. Oh, yeah, it was nice. Good. Very nice. A show where we can come in talking about Alameda and leave talking about Alameda. Wow. That's a blessing. Uh, yes, it is. Jerry Feidelberg, thank you for joining me yet again, making me happy. That's the result. I always come away with a smile on my face. That or I become educated somewhat. And you are uh, not only a um, an A's, um, uh, what are, what is is your title now? You're you're a journalist. You sit I'm in the press a, box. I'm just you the beat think? writer for beat writer for the A's for Sports Radio Service. And uh, while, while we're here, before we close, I'd like to give out a shout out to our friend Michael Duca. Uh, Michael had uh, eyelid surgery yesterday. And he's recovering quite well. Can't see too well out of his eyes, but we know he's... I, we're, I read we're that this him. morning. Was that an elective, elective surgery? Why the surgery in the first place? It's because the eye, the eyelids were drooping and they were, they were causing some vision. Probably his vision wasn't that good. So they, they had to remove some tissue. Oh, but he's okay. going to be fine. He's going to be fine. Cool. But I just, we're wishing him a get well soon, quick, Michael. We miss you. We want you back on the program. Absolutely, a big part of the Comfortably Zone Radio Network, and our friend, who um, the three of us would, win better times, we'd uh, meet at our favorite place in Alameda, Nations, and uh, uh, we can't do that. It's been like a year. This is craziness. Um, yeah. So let's hope within the next, uh, what with the vaccine, the good news, and it is very good news about these uh, Johnson & Johnson, the, the one hitter, that kind of thing. We only have to get one one shot. That's, uh, that's going to improve things. Biden said today that, what did he say, by the end of May, everybody will be vaccinated that wants to be. The problem is convincing people to and convincing them to live to get vaccinated by keeping their masks on and social distancing and all those things that we can't give up on now that we're just so close to winning the war and a war it's been let me tell you more people have died from this than in all the wars combined so yeah for um, sure for sure and, and keep in mind that there really hasn't been much of a flu season this year because people are wearing masks. Right, exactly. And um, that should tell people people uh, something to begin with. But to these governors like West Virginia, and uh, it always seems like the South, to, Texas is really the South, if the, the tr truth be known. They have a Southern mentality. And opening up too soon could set us back six months. Yeah, look, you know, the government has mandated certain things. We, we have to wear seat belts in your car. You can get a ticket if you're not wearing a seat belt. They mandated that uh, people riding to wear helmets. They may not want to do it, but they have to do it. So, they're, they're, you know, when you cross the street, there's a sign that says, don't walk. You, you don't walk if you walk across. If you violate that, you can get a ticket. These are sensible things to protect lives. And mm -hmm. then wearing, the mask, wearing a mask is such a cheap price to pay to save your life or someone that you love's life. 
you know, there, if you have, if you're carrying the disease and you have no symptoms, you could spread it to your, to your wife, to your mother, to your kids, to your grandparents. You can do serious damage. And you wouldn't, Absolutely. no one would want to do that. And, and the common sense, common sense, sense says, wear a mask. It's not a big deal. And wear a mask even after you've been vaccinated because you can still get it, not be sick, and transmit it. Right. Exactly. So, um, thank you for, among other things, your pharmaceutical advice. Pharmacist of the Year in California, 1995, Jerry Feidelberg. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Great show. Thank you, Ralph. Bye-bye now. Thank you also for listening, everybody. It is the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Jerry Feidelberg is a gem. Um, I'm Ralph Tycho, not so much of a gem, kind of the weak link. <laughs> but <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> no, you? You give good podcasts, Ralph. I give good podcasts. That's the one skill I have. And it isn't because of anything but getting good guests. So, and to let them talk. And Jerry, you're an example of my success in podcasting. Hire a good guest. <laughs> I, I, you use the term lightly, hire. Um, Jerry, thank you again. Thanks for listening, everybody. Happy trails. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.